So Jana asked me to do a taste lecture, and that's uh, that's sort of slightly challenging in a way because um, my field of expertise is uh, competition law, which probably most people don't have a clue what that is. So it's not like a criminal law. You know, we can't have a nice chat about murder. Uh, because however complicated that might turn out to be, we all kind of know that murder is wrong. But with competition law, we, we often don't really even have the intuition that this behaviour is wrong. Uh, and so um, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to try in this lecture to link it to some of the problems we have today and kind of give an outline uh, uh, as to what's going on. And. Um, so I thought I'd start with a little bit of Tolstoy, and it's a bit pretentious perhaps, but um, um, I'm kind of keen to do that because um, this uh, presents a competition problem. Uh, obviously, Tolstoy uh, was around some time ago, and uh, it's just kind of nice to see um, uh, these problems being seen as problems, uh, even in Tolstoy's day. Um, so this is how um, uh, Master of Man starts out with this description. And because of this competition law problem, as I'll explain, uh, well, somebody does. So it's a lesson. Um, so maybe if you just start reading this, you can have a look at uh, the city's problem, and then I will talk through um, and explain its relation to the big society and David Cameron. So here we've got um, Vasily, he wants to buy some wood and um, one of the problems uh, that he's got, he's offering uh, 10,000 uh, for the, uh, for the uh, he's offering 7,000 for the wood and the person selling the wood is asking for 10,000 because uh, he knows that uh, um, the city is interesting. Now Vasily is confident that he'll be able to bargain him down. Um, so it sounds okay so far, it's just a normal contractual dispute. But then we read a little bit further and we realise that Vasily is so confident because he's got an agreement with all the other purchasers of wood in the area that none of them will come and purchase this wood um, So because it's in his region. So in other words, he's excluded all the competition from this region. He really is the only possible purchaser. And for this reason, He's confident he's going to buy this wood worth 21,000 for the mere price of seven. So this is kind of a little bit of competition. Maybe you've got an intuition that this seems somehow unfair. So I'm going to talk about uh, Tolstoy. I'm going to use this simple example to illustrate briefly what uh, one of the provisions in the new competition law. And then I'm going to try and talk about uh, a big problem that we've got today. That's uh, David Cameron's big society. And um, no draw. And uh, and as to whether EU competition law is going to hold David Cameron's big society dream in its tracks. If I'm unclear, please uh, just stop me as we go on. Um, but, uh, so this is what I want to talk about. I'm going to have a brief introduction to competition law. Um, I'll introduce the relevant EU provisions. Then I'll discuss this problem that we've got in the UK of binge drinking and uh, question whether or not uh, competition law can provide one of the solutions. Um, I will then lead us through legally how we might solve this problem, how we might find out whether or not competition law is the answer, um, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so first of all, what we're talking about in, in competition law is we're trying to encourage firms to compete. Um, in most of the, uh, well, in all of the countries in the EU, we've adopted this market model where we think that rather than the state fixing the price and uh, the quantity and which goods will be bought and sold, and it's private firms that uh, come and uh, offer their goods in the marketplace and we as individuals select the ones we like. Um, and that way we encourage firms to produce uh, better and better goods because those are the ones that we'll purchase and we won't buy kind of bad goods if you like. And so in a way by just allowing us free reign as purchasers, the idea is that um, companies will be forced to improve their price 
and equality ratio. Now, of course, there will always be room for legislation around the edges, of course. We, we don't want companies to, uh, to poison us with their food and all this sort of stuff. But uh, so around these uh, edges, um, we've got competition. But what we found in economic theory is that uh, you can't just unleash companies like that. Because if you do, you find very powerful companies, for example, that um, get enormous um, power in the market. You might think perhaps Microsoft is one of these companies. And if you get as much power as Microsoft, um, the power that nearly everybody in this room presumably has uh, Microsoft uh, operating system on their computer and Microsoft programs, when you've got this kind of power, then sometimes you can exploit um, consumers because they sort of need you. And so this is one of the tools that we have in EU competition law, the ability to stop powerful firms abusing their dominant position. Another of the rules that we've got in EU competition law is a rule to stop restrictive agreements, to stop agreements that restrict competition, and that's the kind of that's the rule that I will be focusing on today, and that's uh, the rule we'll use to attack uh, the sea. Um, now, of course, if you have a rule against um, firms getting together and making anti-competitive agreements, one way that firms could get around those rules is just to merge. I mean, if uh, I merge, then I don't have to make an anti-competitive agreement with anyone anymore. Um, because we're one and the same firm, I can just tell my subsidiary what to do. So competition law often has um, merger rules as well, um, and the EU is no exception. And the final sort of string to the competition law bow in the EU is um, the state aid rules. And the state aid rules are designed, um, are there, because often what we find is that states will try to favour the companies um, in their, um, you know, the UK will try to favour UK companies and they will often offer them aid and try to, you know, um, help them out in um, the marketplace. So maybe give them tax breaks and that kind of thing. And so we also have the state aid rules to try to keep the state in check as well, to make sure that the state does leave a level playing field at least for European companies. So here are the four. Um, tools that we have in European competition law to try to keep firms honest, if you like, to try to stop them um, behaving anti-competitively. Um, so now I just want to spend a little more time looking at Article 101. This is the uh, provision that deals with a, a restrictive agreements. This is the provision that we're going to use to, uh, uh, as our lens for analysing the Silly's um, wood problem. And Article 101 basically um, comes in uh, two parts. Um, firstly, it's got the prohibition, and secondly, it's got uh, an exemption provision that you can um, escape from jail uh, if you fall within that. So, I'm just going to talk briefly about how Article 101 and how it works, and then um, what we'll do is we'll move on and look at the city, and then I'll talk about binge drinking and how um, Article 101 might prevent us from solving the binge drinking problem. Okay, so Article 101, um, this deals with agreements between undertakings. Um, for the purposes of today, we'll just treat undertakings as firms, but it's slightly more technical. It's basically anyone sort of acting in the marketplace, um, in essence, as a business. Um, so these agreements between undertakings which affect trade between member states. This is an EU provision, of course, so we're trying to see whether or not um, uh, the member states are sort of um, affected. And this agreement must, must have as its object or effect um, either to prevent or to restrict or to distort competition within the internal market, within the EU. And then the provision gives us some nice examples. So, for example, if um, uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, those are two undertakings, if they made an agreement to fix the prices, so they said, okay, from now on, Coca-Cola and Pepsi will cost uh, uh, two pounds per can, um, they would be pushing up the price. Uh, 
and that could be an anti-competitive agreement um, because it's directly or indirectly fixing purchase or selling prices. Um, another uh, way that you can have a restriction of competition is if you say to, if these firms agreed that they wouldn't sell, for example, Pepsi might say, okay, I won't sell in the UK, um, but I'll sell in France, and Coca-Cola, you don't sell in France, uh, but you can sell in the UK. So they would basically separate the territories into which they can sell, and that of course makes them very powerful in those territories. They limited the amount of competition um, that's taking place there. Okay, so this is the prohibition. Have you got an agreement between uh, undertakings that is going to restrict or distort competition? And if you have got an agreement like that, then Article 101, Paragraph 2 says this agreement is void ab initio, so it never legally existed. Like that. Um, unless you can get an exemption, unless you can fall within this exemption provision, um, this exemption provision has got uh, four cumulative tests. Um, I just focused on the first one here to keep it simple, but um, essentially, if you can show that um, that your agreement um, improves production or the distribution of goods or promotes technical and economic progress, then maybe you can get out of jail. But you've got a bit of a fight there. It's European law, so we interpret exemptions restrictively, um, and it's pretty tough. So this is the challenge. This is the way. This is the way that article works. And now I just want to spend a little time applying that to the city and trying to figure out what's going on um, there, just as a little example. So here we've got the city again. So basically, the city is confident that he can buy this land for seven thousand, even though the real market value is twenty-one thousand. And the reason why he's confident of that, the reason why he's confident that he can get a really cheap price, is because he's essentially got an agreement with all the other purchasers of land in the area. And he says, "I'm the only one that's going to purchase land in this district." You guys have got your own districts. I won't purchase, purchase from your districts. You don't purchase from mine. And so that way, rather like Pepsi and Coca-Cola making an agreement that one of them will sell in France and the other one only in the UK, they've divided up this market between them. So they are basically the only purchaser in their area. And of course, if you're the only purchaser in the area, you've got much more power and control over price. So that's why the city is really confident that he's going to be able to push down the price to 7,000 um, away from the 21,000 that it's really worth. So it's quite a clever scheme. Um, the problem for, Z for Silly is he's noticed that somebody who's not in that scheme, somebody from outside, he's found out is coming to town to try to buy the land. And so the Silly is really nervous because this is competition coming into his area. Um, and so the city sets out in the snow to try to buy the land cheaply as quickly as he can before this outsider, before the one who didn't make, didn't join in the agreement, comes to town. So let's just sort of quickly have a think about how that works under Article 101. Now, of course, this was in Russia, um, and so there's a slight technical problem there, but let's just pretend that it was in Wales. Um, and um, just running through the test in Article 101, there is an agreement. Um, these guys that buy land, they all agreed that they would stay and only purchase land in their territories. Um, it's between undertakings because even though these are just private individuals, they are purchasing these as part of a business. Um, and so they count as undertakings too, even though they're not companies. Does it prevent, uh, restrict, or distort competition? Well, yes, it falls directly within one of the examples that we saw. It limits um, territories to different people. And does it affect trade between member states? That was more of a problem, but uh, now it's in Wales, there's a good chance that uh, it'll do that too. So here we've got an agreement that prima facie seems to breach Article 101, Paragraph 1. Um, now, obviously, there's more nuanced uh, parts to these interpretations, but I'm sort of just racing through this uh, to give you a flavour. Now, 
Vasily might be able to get an exemption. Could he argue that his agreement um, improves uh, production or the distribution of goods? Um, and the reality is he's going to really struggle to do that. I mean, basically, this agreement is almost certainly just in the private interest of the parties to the agreement, and it's not in the interest of everybody else. For example, this agreement is really pushing down the price of the wood, and so it's going to discourage people from um, growing trees in the area, uh, which is going to allocate resources away from a place that perhaps they would be most uh, efficiently used. So it is possible to come up with some economic arguments as to how he could um, further fall within this provision, but he's really going to struggle quite a lot. Okay, so where are we so far? Well, basically, um, what I've done is I've introduced the four sort of main types of competition law rule. Um, and we've had a quick look at one of the rules, um, which uh, prevents um, anti-competitive agreements between firms. Um, now what I want to do is move on and think a little bit about um, the big society, because I've got a bigger problem to pose. Um, how many of you are from the UK? Okay, so, you know, maybe 40%. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the UK. There are many good things uh, about this country, but there are some problems too. And one of the problems that we have is uh, binge drinking. And uh, binge drinking uh, is essentially where uh, often young people, but sometimes old ones, uh, get drunk on a Friday and Saturday night um, by drinking extraordinary quantities of alcohol, and uh, then uh, a sick, have a fight, uh, break some windows, uh, go to hospital, all the sort of things that you would probably hope not to be doing on a Friday and Saturday night. Now this really is a massive problem in the UK. Um, we spend uh, a lot of money um, uh, clearing up after these people. Uh, I remember last summer I was passing a Liverpool Street uh, train station and there was a big tent uh, outside the Liverpool Street, Street train station. I was like, why? Why is there a big tent outside the train station? I mean, that's kind of bizarre. We're in the middle of a city and yet there's a tent. And uh, basically the big tent was um, for putting the binge drinkers in the tent so that the uh, hospital staff could look after them um, because they were too uh, inebriated to get home. So, I mean, it's a pretty big problem. Um, it causes uh, billions of pounds um, uh, for the NHS to try to treat these people. It causes millions of pounds for the police trying to clear up from them. They cause damage to themselves, of course, to their livers, which, of course, we then have to pay for with the NHS. Um, uh, they cause violence to their partners and their friends and people passing in the street. They smash windows. So, there's all sorts of terrible terrible problems associated with binge drinking. And there have been some very big studies recently in the UK about what can be done um, in relation to this. Uh, one of the studies has been done by the British Medical Association, which is, um, uh, it's kind of obvious. So, um, and the British Medical Association said that um, a variety of measures need to be used in order to tackle binge drinking. This isn't sounding very much like a competition law anymore, is it? But a variety of measures need to be used to tackle binge drinking. And um, uh, there needs to be better education, and we need to make, um, uh, we need to sort of try to break the association between um, romance and coolness and alcohol, something that's been quite successfully done with cigarettes in the UK recently. Um, we need to, uh, the BMA said, increase the price of alcohol because it's too cheap. Um, for example, if you go into supermarkets, you can buy alcohol for uh, less than you can buy water. Um, and um, so there's this sort of a whole raft of things that you, you, you need to do. Government, of course, has been pretty unwilling to act. And we've seen some, perhaps, some slight changes in the last few months, but um, essentially uh, they seem pretty unwilling. Um, but what government were quite willing to do was they were quite willing to criticise the supermarkets. Um, amongst uh, others, uh, Tesco, massive supermarket in the UK, um, the chairman of Tesco was uh, christened the godfather of binge drinking 
uh, by a couple of parliamentarians. And um, in fact, he was asked, he was called in and asked to explain to Parliament why Tesco was selling alcohol so cheaply. Just to put our competition law hat on for the moment, by the way, selling things cheaply is a good thing in competition law. Okay, so now perhaps you start to see the essence of my problem. Um, so basically, the, the chairman of Tesco comes into te uh, to the Houses of Parliament and he said, Well, I've got a problem. Of course, I hate binge drinking too. Um, but I will not put up my prices by myself. Because if I put up my prices by myself, everyone is just going to go to Asda and Sainsbury and all the other big supermarkets. So that's an odd starter. Secondly, he said, I would, of course, be very happy to agree with Asda, Sainsbury's and all the other supermarkets to um, fix the price of alcohol, to push up the price of alcohol to a high level. Um, and that would, of course, help discourage the binge drinking. Unfortunately, uh, said the chairman of Tesco, the competition rules will not allow me to do that. And we've just seen with the city, the competition rules don't allow undertakings, which would include supermarkets, to make agreements that restrict competition, which would include pushing up the price. So, this is the problem. Tesco says they would be happy to do this kind of thing, but the competition rules are preventing them. And yet we've got this massive social problem in the UK um, called binge drinking. Is the chairman of Tesco right? Well, the opinion is divided. We've got the European Commission here. The objective of Article 81, and um, that's the old name for Article 101 before the treaty changes. The objective of Article 81 is essentially consumer welfare, which for our purposes, let's just say, is low prices. So if you find companies that are raising their prices together, especially when they're competitors, that's going to be a massive alarm bell ringing for the Commission because they think that's in breach of the competition rule clause. We also had a general court, um, that's the second highest court in Europe, um, a general court ruling in 2006 saying consumer welfare is the sole goal of Article 101, so echoing um, what the Commission said. And if you go out into the real world, uh, then you'll find that nearly every competition lawyer, nearly every competition authority that you agree with, that you speak to at least in Europe, will also say that consumer welfare is the sole goal of the competition rules. And then you've got the end, Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, we think that there are many other goals uh, that are relevant. So what's the answer? Before I discuss what the answer is, uh, or before I discuss methodologies of finding the answer, um, I just want to explain why this is particularly important today. Okay, actually this is why it's particularly important generally and then we'll do today. So what are the advantages of just looking at prices? What are the advantages of doing what the Commission suggests? Well there are actually quite a lot of advantages. It's not that the Commission doesn't care about the environment, the Commission does. But what the Commission is saying is let's use competition law to make as much wealth as we can in society. So if you like to make as big a cake as possible. And then if we think that the way the free market has worked has not um, resulted in the, um, the best distribution of wealth, perhaps we think some people are too rich and some people are too poor, or if we think that um, this free competition is affecting the environment in a way that we don't like, then we can use other um, laws and tools to redistribute that wealth later. So there's sort of a two-stage process. Competition law is just about prices and trying to create as big a pie as possible. And then if you think that's created unfair results, come along later and use tax or subsidies to alter this process. But don't interfere in the market mechanism. There's also an international trend. So more and more competition rules are moving towards a pure consumer welfare approach. So that means that um, when our companies go out into the wider world and try to sell products there, if our rules are just consumer welfare-based rules, just cheap prices, then um, uh, 
they're used to this kind of rules, and when they go out into other countries, they'll find similar rules with similar goals there too. It's also more, more justiciable. So when you've got a law just aiming at one thing, it's much easier for courts and decision makers to decide. It's much easier for companies to predict uh, what's going on. Okay. And it avoids, it's, it avoids politicization. This is quite important because um, the entities that are implementing competition law are often independent. So, for example, the Office of Fair Trading doesn't really have any parliamentary scrutiny. They have to give a report once every five years, I think, to Parliament. Uh, Parliament appoints um, uh, the chairman and the chief executive, but that's basically the limit of parliamentary scrutiny, and that's quite normal now in the European Union. And so, if you keep um, uh, just focusing on prices, that's not such a political thing. So there's many advantages in just looking at prices. What are the disadvantages? Well, if you can also take account of other goals, if you can also, for example, take account of public health and allow the supermarkets to get together, push up the price in order to um, provide these health benefits that the British Medical Association says are there. Um, then you would perhaps get a better answer more quickly um, rather than having cheap prices and then using some of the money to have an advertising campaign against drinking. Uh, perhaps if you push up the price, then you just get the result you look for uh, more quickly. But it has to be said that the evidence there is not very clear, so we have to be a bit cautious. It also could be quite an expensive way of achieve, achieving these goals. So economists have written quite a lot about what are the cheapest tools to use to achieve health or environmental aims, and um, balancing them, distorting competition more, and to achieve these aims, maybe that's an expensive way. There are also some things you can't compensate for later. If somebody drinks the alcohol that's really cheap, dies, and of course the fact that you're going to use some of these taxes for an advertising campaign next year, it's a bit later then. Um, so it's these sort of problems. There are questions about whether it's also moral um, and whether in many instances it is more efficient to split up these things. So there are some pros and cons of adopting the commission idea of just focusing on cheap prices or um, also taking account of public health and other goals in the competition rules. That's particularly important today um, because um, uh, in the UK, for example, David Cameron has made an explicit uh, statement uh, when he took power that he wants to have this big society. And the big society, if I understand it correctly, is uh, it's not just leaving things to the state. It's not just leaving um, having a nice society, having a good environment, having healthy people. That's not just up to the state anymore. That's up to us as individuals to join in and help build this perfect place. And um, one of the things he said specifically in relation to competition law is that if competition law is preventing um, uh, firms like uh, Tesco getting together to achieve health improvements, if competition law is really stopping that, then he will do everything he can to prevent this happening. So, uh, quite a strong statement from the Prime Minister. Of course, this is European law, so it doesn't really matter what he thinks, but um, we have an agreement in UK law too, so. Um, okay, so let me just um, take a step back and think about the problem that we're posing ourselves now. We had a quick introduction to what is EU competition law, and we looked at one of the provisions which says um, you mustn't restrict competition, you mustn't push up prices um, in agreements between firms. We looked at Vasily, he was uh, restricting competition in his agreement, and then we looked at a practical example today, and that is that um, uh, we've got a lot of binge drinking problems in the UK, we've got um, the chairman of Tesco saying if he could agree with the other supermarkets, he would push up the price of alcohol, and uh, the British Medical Association has said pushing up the price of alcohol is one of the things that, we, that would help reduce binge drinking. However, we've got competition law that seems to be standing in our way and saying, no, you can't take account of public health in the competition rules. What you have to do is just focus on cheap prices 
and take it down to public health meeting. And this brings us to a question of how do you interpret the European Treaty? How do you interpret European law? Now, of course, in English statutes, um, we've got our own favourite way of interpretation. And the main thing that judges do there, of course, is to uh, get out their Oxford English Dictionary. If they have any problems with any of the words, and they have a little check and see what is the simple, clear meaning of those words. And that's the way we come to statutory interpretation in the UK. There are other things that you do when you're really struggling, but the basic method of interpretation is to look at the words and just kind of simply figure out what they mean. Now this doesn't work very well in the European Union, where you've got 27 countries and 17 languages, all of which are original language versions and some of which contradict. And so in the European Union, as with many other international treaties, we don't really find this English kind of interpretation uh, very often. If you use this English kind of interpretation in relation to Article 101, you're going to find it pretty hard to take account of um, public health. I mean, public health is certainly not clearly mentioned in any of these exemptions. These sound as though they're kind of economic things. Now, you could interpret some of them more widely. I mean, you could interpret some of them, perhaps, environmental protection would be improving production of goods or improving technical progress, but certainly public health doesn't seem to easily fit in there. So if we're using the English uh, literal interpretation, then that's not going to get us very far um, in helping David Cameron. Um, but in European law, we don't really use that method of interpretation very much. It's not to say that the words are irrelevant, um, but the judges use uh, two interpretive methods uh, much more commonly, certainly in hard cases. The first is the teleological approach. Um, this means that they focus on the telos, or the goals of the treaty, so they try to figure out what the treaty is trying to do, and then they look at the interpreting provisions, like the competition rules, and they interpret them in line with the goals. How will these help us achieve these goals. Sort of, you can see it as a pyramid almost. And they use a contextual approach. So, um, what they say is, you, uh, Judge Edwards, for example, who was uh, the UK, uh, one of the UK judges um, for a long time, he said the uh, treaties are a web of interrelated provisions, and you must see them as a web. You must read them not individually, but um, uh, all interlinking. And for example, if we look in the treaty, we see um, uh, this provision, Article 168, Paragraph 1, which says, a high level of human health protection shall be ensured in the definition and implementation of all union policies and activities. So this is kind of weird. I mean, now, sort of, uh, from nowhere, we have a provision that says, when you interpret the treaty, in you know, all of the union policies and activities, you must ensure that a high level of human health protection is ensured. Now this is quite important because maybe this is going to be a way in for us to not use the literal interpretation in Article 101, but perhaps expand it more widely. So here's a conclusion. It's also helped us because he gave us an example, a simple example of a competition law problem. The problem that we started to pose ourselves though was um, we've got David Cameron's big society, we've got his wish that private actors, not just the state, is going to be involved in um, improving health, cleaning the snow off our streets, and all these other goals. If we interpret Article 101 using the Commission's uh, literal interpretation, then we'll find that it's only to do with getting cheap prices, perhaps improving quality of goods, but it's a very myopic um, view. This is an economic rule, it's got economic goals, and we look at it in isolation from the rest of the treaty. If we interpret Article 101 like that, 
if that's the way to interpret it, and let's be clear, this is the way that nearly everyone in the competition world interprets Article 101 at the moment, then um, we can't really do anything. Uh, Tesco's was right. They can't get together with the other supermarkets and push up the price for alcohol. They can't really do anything together with their competitors to reduce binge drinking. They could, of course, act independently, but of course they won't do that because Asda will just undercut them. Now, for many years, public policy was taken into account in Article 101. It's only since 2000 that we've seen a big shift and in favour of this purely economic approach. And now I guess the question that I'm posing is, uh, in light of David Cameron uh, and this big society, whether we're going to see a, a push, the pendulum now sw swinging back and trying to reintroduce these public policy goals into Article 101.